I'm talking this afternoon to distinguished Professor Chenapati Jagadish of the Australian National University. Professor Jagadish has just been named the next president of the Australian Academy of Science, the peak body for scientists in this country. Professor Jagadish, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ian. Congratulations on your appointment. This is a, a, a very big day for Australian science. You are the first Indian-born Australian appointed to the presidency of the Academy. That's a great honour. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ian, and I'm uh, truly humbled and grateful for this honour. And uh, I'm looking forward to giving something back to the community and then providing leadership to the Academy. You were, um, your, your, your backstory is fascinating, Professor. You were born in humble circumstances in India. There, there aren't too many people in Australia that grow up without electricity. It sounds as though learning was a, a, a really key part of, uh, of the drive in you from a very early age. Yes, uh, absolutely, Ian. And uh, so basically, my father used to be a primary school teacher. He has always believed in the importance of education. So that's, he has always encouraged that one. And then of course, he is, uh, we come from a farming family and then he moved from teaching to farming again. And then, but he always encouraged uh, all the children, whomever he met with all his life is to really, you know, importance of education and then, uh, you know, how that can make a big difference in people's lives. When you went to high school, it sounds as though a teacher took a particular interest in you and was really of great assistance. Yeah, I'm truly grateful to two of my teachers. And then uh, one teacher, my maths teacher, Chagan Disambiridi, and then I lived with him. And uh, so I studied with him for three years uh, during my eighth, ninth and tenth of my high school. But I also had another teacher who really taught me English and social studies. And then he was really humble, honest, sim simple. And then he really taught me the humility and uh, uh, the uh, trying to be always, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to be humble and uh, also try to be grounded. And uh, so that really made a huge difference for me in my life. And one really taught me the importance of hard work and persistence. And one taught me the importance of being humble and kind and generous to others. So both of them really, including in addition to my parents, really set me, set the scene for me as a person in my life. Right. Uh, I'm very keen to ask you some questions about your work. Um, but ju just continuing on this theme, I couldn't help but notice that you you are a, a, an inveterate um, supervisor of PhDs. Uh, you, you, you're up to... 70 or 80 PhD students you've you've um, supervised in your career and mentored a lot of postdocs as well. So clearly that that education support is something that you've brought to your professional life as well. Uh, absolutely, uh, Ian, that uh, really, for me, the most important part of my life has been making the difference in other people's lives. Of course, my science is important for me. And then also, of course, recognition, so other things follow if you're doing good science. But the most important uh, thing for me has been to train the, my students and postdoctoral fellows and then see their success and then achieving their dreams and goals has been the most satisfying thing part of my life. You know, I'm really humbled that I had a great uh, opportunity to be able to work with so many bright young people. They are really in leading positions in academia in government and industry. And uh, really, it's been really fun, great fun working with all of them. Now, Professor, you lead the ANU's Semiconductor Optoelectronics and Nanotechnology Group. I was wondering if you might explain to me how the definition of nano has evolved over your career. So the, basically, in the 90s, we have been working on microtechnology. And uh, so then it's a natural progression for, for us has been to really move towards smaller and smaller dimensions. And then when we were started getting into the nanoscale, the properties of the materials have changed quite significantly. The classical physics fails and quantum physics starts coming into picture. And that's what really led for us to curiosity to really develop the new technologies and try to understand the material properties at the nanoscale and how they're being different than the bulk properties and then make use of them for making an innovative optoelectronic devices. So that's what we've been working on. Okay, as, a, as an ordinary citizen, how would I uh, how would I come across nanotechnology in everyday life? Where am I likely to see it? 
So we are using EM uh, nanotechnology uh, in uh, all parts of our life today. For example, if we are really using computers and any electronic devices, already the transistors which have been used in our computers are below 10 nanometers in the smallest features which have been used, for example. Smaller the features of the devices, they, they consume less energy. You can switch them on and off faster. You can pack more devices as well, for example. So we got billions of transistors in our uh, computer chips because of the fact that we're able to really make them smaller and smaller and smaller, for example. So that okay. means we are all, every day we are using it. And already people are using it in sunscreens, for example. And uh, so nowadays you can apply the sunscreen and uh, you don't see that you have applied the sunscreen because you are using nanoparticles. They're absorbing the UV rays but allow, allowing the visible light to pass through. So that's why you don't see that you are applying the sunscreen, for example. Ah. So they're doing the job, but uh, in now now they're all part, becoming part of makeup and other things as well in the daily life, for example. Right. So the nanotechnology is really playing an important role. For example, LED lights. LED lights, in fact, we work on LEDs, for example, light emitting diodes. And LEDs, my right. students are manufacturing uh, millions of uh, LEDs uh, in uh, China and other parts of the world, for example. And so really we are using nanotechnology there. The lasers which we are using for communications, for example, optical fiber communications and internet, they're making use of a lot of nanotechnology as well. And again, we make we also make lasers as well in our research, in our research group. I, I understand that the, the, the you, you have made in, extremely fine lasers. I think I, I read that many beams could fit into the into the um, circumference of a human hair. What does one use a laser like that for? We are making, as you pointed out, uh, Ian, that uh, about 20 lasers within the width of your hair where we can put. Again, the smaller the laser, you can switch it off on and faster. That means you can send information faster. For example, in fact, nowadays, when you're making computer chips, the, even within the chip or chip to chip the communication is slowed down because of use of copper wires. And people want to use light because light really moves faster. And uh, so that's where these nano lasers can play an important role, for example. Also, you can make use of them for sensors, for example. And even people are using these nano lasers for biological imaging applications, for example. So there are many applications for these nano lasers. They consume less energy. You can pack more lasers in a small area. Also, they can be switched on and off faster. So those are the three immediate uh, benefits of using small lasers. Right. Understood. Professor, um, you're going to be leading the peak body for scientists in Australia. How do you think um, Australian science, Australian research is comparing to work in the rest of the world? You know, Australian sci science does very well with respect to the rest of the world, but then the rest of the world has been investing quite significantly. That is something which we need to really start doing that one as well. And if you don't do that one, what will happen is that we cannot sit on our laurels and then say that uh, we, we are doing very well. So it means, you know, we'll be lagging behind. So that's why it is important for us to really invest in R&D and science and technology or STEM, essentially, uh, to really be able to be competitive and also be able to develop the technologies which are important for the well-being of our planet, for example. Right. Professor, you, you've, you're on the record as saying we... We need to to um, drift away from being a resource driven country. We need to we, we need to look at different ways to make our living here in Australia. What what do you see uh, Australia being in um, in five, 10, 15 years? So by 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 in really strategically investing in R and D on targeted technologies, and we should really be able to move gradually transition towards the knowledge-based economy or techn technology-based economy, for example. And particularly because of the fact that uh, these some of these devices which we are talking about, for example, nanotechnology-based uh, technology uh, the devices, for example, and they're not heavy bulk things which we cannot really ship to any part of the world, for example. We can ship them anywhere. A box can be a million dollar devices, for example. You know, a box of lasers, for example, right? So really, this science is, uh, is, is going to continue to play an important role. In fact, it's going to play more and more important role in the future when we are developing technologies. Australia can really play an important role. And al already we know that in medical areas, and then you know, our uh, uh, country really plays a very, you know, very in developed innovative technologies. And we should also start thinking about really investing in the wide variety areas of STEM 
where we can be able to really make an impact in terms of starting high tech industries and also train people particularly young people in stem areas so that they can see the future uh, for themselves uh, and then uh, particularly if you're developing these industries they can immediately see the future for them in terms of uh, finding uh, jobs in industry for example so it can make a huge difference to the society and also creating opportunities for the next generation is absolutely critical for the good of the country and good of the people as well mm. It's COVID's been uh, well. It's been tough on everyone, but it's been particularly tough on the university sector. So I imagine, given that your new role uh, will will give you the ear of some of those in uh, lofty positions in the country, this this might well be a focus of what you're talking about uh, with with those in power. Uh, absolutely, and, and uh, so as as you can see that you know this, uh, the uh, COVID and the pandemic really shown the importance of science and the importance of science-based uh, policy decisions and uh, how they can really impact the society and how it, they could be beneficial. And in the same way, we should also move towards uh, science-based policy and science for policy and policy-based science, for example. And both we should do in order to be able to really support science and also make use of science while you are making decisions for the future of the country. So uh, funding, um, appropriate funding and a focus on technology will be um, two of the things that you, you focus on. Uh, are there other things that really interest you as president and that you'll give attention to? Of course, so I've always said that the future is in the hands of the young people and then that's why we need to really make sure that the young people are really thriving. If the young people are thriving in STEM areas and you know, all the good things happen and also we need to create entrepreneurship culture as well so that you create opportunities so that the you know, young people, they, after finishing their PhD, they get an opportunity to go and start a company based on the technologies which they developed in, during their PhD, for example. So that can really open lots of doors for really, that, that right, right environment is really critical. And right ecosystem is very critical in order to be able to enable these things to happen, for example. That's where the governments have a really, very important role to play. And particularly in the early stage technology development, for example. So basically, we need to really try to invest in the full spectrum from the fundamental sciences to the applied sciences and including opportunities for commercialization of the technologies being developed in the applied areas. It is a full pipeline. And uh, so really, you never know what are the discoveries which have been made today in the fundamental areas. Will they'll see that they'll find applications tomorrow, for example. Right. So today we are using mathematics everywhere, for example. Lots of you know, high-tech companies are using maths, for example. And uh, again, physics and chemistry is quite widely used, for example. In, uh, even in the medical sciences, we are really making use of biology and physics and chemistry and maths and engineering, and even to really be able to develop medical technology. So really, we need to really work together and uh, really uh, try to really make people aware the importance of the interlinked nature of the science and the importance of investing in all aspects of science and STEM. We all need to be technologists in the future. It's yeah. We all need to learn, learn to code. I think I've heard that quite a few times lately. Professor, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of my production team saying, keep it under 20 minutes. So it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Congratulations again on your appointment and I wish you the very best of success. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ian. And then if, uh, if before closing, and I would like to just mention about uh, the endowment which my wife Vidya and I have started to really support uh, the young students and then uh, the young researchers from the developing countries to come to Australia and spend some time at the ANU so that they can, the doors can be opened for them. There are lots of bright people around and then we really need to really provide opportunities for them. Fantastic. How would people find out more about the endowment, Professor? We, we have, uh, there's a website, if you really type in Jagadish Endowment and you'll see the information and then uh, people can apply for these positions. And uh, sometimes people think that that endowment is for just for Indian students. It's not, it is for any student from the developing world. Fantastic. Um, a great mention and thank you again for joining me. Thank you very much, Ian. It was a pleasure talking to you.